So usually I, I speak at physics conferences and the food is not nearly as good as here and we don't see as many women <laughs> and uh, you don't get introduced by donkeys. So uh, it's a little bit different. <clears throat> so I've changed the title a little bit of today's talk and originally it was Let There Be Light but because the talk's going to focus on light-based technologies, I've decided to call it the power of light in the palm of your hand. And it will be clear during the course of the talk why I've given it that particular angle. So I always begin talks by dispelling a few myths. And the first myth I want to dispel is that I'm not rich, okay? <laughs> so even though my name is Forbes, and if I'm in a bad mood at Woolworths, and they see my credit card and it says, a Forbes, they say, are you Alexander Forbes? I say, yeah, that's me, that's me. <clears throat> but no, I'm a very poor academic and um, recently joined WITS to try and get some structured light research going in the Department of Physics. And for the school children, but they're none here, but I'll use it anyway for this audience, um, I'm not cleverer than you. Although, mind you, maybe, yeah, but... But in general, not. So I might know a little bit more about this topic. And at the end, you have the chance to ask lots of questions so that you can gain some of that knowledge as well. And I hope the only thing I can do tonight is really get you excited about the topic and show you how wonderful light is and all the things that it's done to our lives. And with that, you can go and explore it yourself. So people ask me, what do I do as a scientist? And the answer I usually give is that I have fun with the taxpayer's money. So that's what I do. I go to work and I have lots of fun. And this year I've been working really hard and it's because of this guy. So this is John Dudley and he's the chairperson of the International Year of Light. So how many people in the audience know that 2015 is the International Year of Light? You can raise your hand. Ah, terrible. <laughs> I'll tell John he's doing a bad job. So this year is the International Year of Light <clears throat> and the idea is to celebrate all the advances that we've had in light. And it's a UNESCO event, which means that it's meant to transcend boundaries, national boundaries, and so it really is truly international. It's not meant only to be about science, so it touches on sustainability and culture and art, as well, of course, as science and technologies. And it's meant to be something that all nations participate in, for the good of mankind. It has to have some potential benefits. So it's an officially a UNESCO event. And why 2015? Well, if you go back in history, there have been many milestones in the development of light. So if you go back a thousand years, the first recorded uh, book on optics dealing with refraction and reflection and the laws that later are credited to people like Snell was actually from the Arab world. That's the seat of learning back in the dark ages of Europe. And of course, over the next 500 years, Europe caught up. And so many of the advances thereafter were done in Europe and the US. So in 1815, Fresnel, as a student, developed a mathematical theory of how to describe light as a wave. And that's a theory we still use today. <clears throat> and if you, you can go through all the ages, I'm not going to read all of them to you but there are key milestones that coincide with 2015, and for those reasons it was chosen. The other reason is that, and it's a little bit of an anecdotal story, is that in 2010, we had the 50th anniversary of the laser. And we missed that as a scientific community to celebrate it and to get the nations and the governments aware of what laser technology has done. And so there was a decision made not to miss out again, and so we're trying to drive lights as the new paradigm. So why should we celebrate lights? <clears throat> well, the obvious thing is that, of course, without light, we wouldn't have any life. Can you imagine if we had all the lights off, which we see in this country from time to time, right? But um, there wouldn't be any humanity at all without lights. So we're using this year to drive education. So UNESCO events are all about education and how to empower the new generation to take these technologies forward. And so it's all about driving to the youth and showing them the power of light. Now my talk is going to be mostly about technologies and science because I'm a physicist. But I work very closely with some artists in this country and of course light 
and art go hand in hand. Light is very beautiful. And here is a collage of some little postcards made by artists all over the world to celebrate in an abstract way different aspects about lights. And if you go to the UNESCO site, you can download the most beautiful images. There have been photo competitions and video competitions all over the world, including South Africa, in order to try and, and bring out the beauty of lights in an artistic way. But that's not going to be the topic of my talk. I'm totally out of my depth to speak on these topics. And so instead, I'm going to speak about the technologies. So I don't know how many people in the audience have seen a picture like this before. A few of you. So it's the earth seen by night. <clears throat> and so the false colors that you see here represent uh, a measure of the intensity of the light given off by those geographical areas. And so you're not surprised to see that Africa is very dark, with the exception, of course, of South Africa and some of the, of the rims around the coast. But Europe and America, Asia, very, very bright. In fact, there's a, obviously a very strong correlation between how developed the nation is and how much light it gives off. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing. On the one hand, of course, it's you want to have lights for safety, for education. There's a big drive in the UNESCO Year of Light called Study After Dark, you'd be surprised how many millions and millions of children can't do homework because they have no light at home. And so, and that you can see just in this picture. Um, the astronomers would say that this is a wonderful artifact of light, okay? They, they don't like to see this. And so, I call it light poverty. The astronomers might uh, invert that a little bit. But of course, photonics, which is taking light and turning it into an enabling technology, could provide some answers to this. So let me show you another plot that maybe you haven't seen before. So this plot now shows a pollution map. It's, in fact, the standard NOx and SOx gases. You don't have to worry about what those are. They're basically atmospheric pollutants. And again, the false color shows how much we give off. And here again, you see that South Africa stands out. So yes, we are much brighter than the rest of the continent but that comes at a cost. And basically that cost is that we burn stuff in order to produce light. And that's not very efficient. So I call this light poverty because we could do it much, much better. I mean, the technology to do this is known and not surprisingly, it uses light as an enabling tool. So we have the most sunshine on average across the country than anywhere else in the world we're one of the prime sites, potentially, for solar energy, but we don't do much about it. And here is a technology that's come out of material science to harness lights to provide energy. So it's a very nice example of the merging of technologies to drive things forward. And so we can use light for sustainability to make things cleaner, but also brighter. This is another one of these false color maps. This time, it's showing internet connectivity. And what it shows is that, again, Africa is very dark. South Africa is fairly well connected. In fact, Africa uses about 4% of the world's total internet connectivity. We take up about 20 to 25% of the world's population. So we're way, way behind in what our usage ought to be. And that's something that we have to deal with. <clears throat> and again, light-based technologies have a lot to say in this regard. So I could use many examples to discuss how light has changed our lives. One of them would just be the lights around us. So many, many years ago, we would have had these old electric light bulbs. And basically, the way they worked is that you would pass a current through a piece of metal. The metal would get hot. Hot metals glow. And so you have some light. That's incredibly inefficient. Today what we do is we have LEDs, we have light-emitting diodes. These are clever materials that are created in such a way that if you apply a small current, they give off light. These are about 10 times more efficient than the old light bulbs. And you would have seen it if you go to the shops and you buy these uh, energy-efficient light bulbs. Usually they have a rating of something like 8 watts, and they say, well, it gives the equivalent of 100 watts or something along those lines. So light-based technologies 
has advanced tremendously over the years. And in fact, the white LED is as a result of physics innovations that gave rise to the 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. If we didn't have the blue LED, we wouldn't have a white LED, and we wouldn't have the lighting that we have. So why give a Nobel Prize to a technology? Because the idea is that if you can cut down the world's energy consumption by a factor of 10, just by having clever lighting sources, then you've done a tremendous job for humanity. So the story here in that technology is the same as any one that I could choose. And we say today that photonics, which is light-based technologies put in action, is the driving mechanism for the new century. We call this the century of the photon. So if you go back 20 years, or you speak to your parents, and you ask them about making telephone calls, it would have been electrons going down copper wires. And today it's light going down fiber optics. Or maybe your old television set from many years ago would have been one of these big bulky tube systems. And the reason they were big and bulky is because they have magnets that steer electrons onto the screen to fluoresce so that you can see an image. Today we don't use electrons to generate an image. Your television today is probably very thin. That's because it's based on a light technology. So it's either a light emitting diode, an LED television, or it's a liquid crystal display, which is another photonic device. In fact, I could go through all the technologies and it would be the same story. Things that were done by electronics in the previous century are being replaced by photonics in this century. So South Africa has got no Silicon Valley. We don't make any microelectronics to speak of in this country. But we don't want to miss out on the photonic revolution. So we're trying to use the International Year of Light to motivate and encourage the governments to look forward and uh, be part of this revolution. So welcome to the century of the photon. That's the message that we want to give to people. But <clears throat> I want to use today's talk to bring some of the technologies home and show you where it might go in the future. So here's a collage of some interesting applications of one of the most famous photonic technologies, which is the laser. So this little device I'm holding in my hand is a miniature laser. It's a laser pointer. It's a little diode laser that gives off red lights. It doesn't do much to you. It's very low power. But if you make them bigger and you change the color and you generate more power, you can start to manipulate matter with light. So the Audi TT, for example, the entire car is laser manufactured. So in the past, if you were to make a car, you would typically have machining that would make the drills and weld the metals together and cut the pieces. Today, that's all done with lasers because it's more efficient, it's cost-effective, and very, very precise. And the same technology has come into the medical field because the wonderful thing about light is it doesn't carry bacteria. It's not physical. There's no... Uh, scalpel that's going to interact with your tissue. Because light can cut but seal at the same time, you have much less bleeding. So lasers and surgery are now ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And here's an operation that um, I've actually had myself. How many people in the audience have ever had laser surgery to their eyes? Ah, just a few. <clears throat> How many people wear glasses? Okay, so you should go and do this. <laughs> <clears throat> so I had it done, and what, you, what happens is that they flap open the eye, and then they ablate your cornea to correct for the aberrations, flap it back, and away you go. And as soon as you, they flap it back, the doctor says, have a look at the clock, can you tell the time? And you can, you can see perfectly. And when I went to do it, actually, the, the doctor said, oh, nurse, we've got a laser physicist with us today. He said, um, Andrew, would you like to see the laser we're going to use? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know a lot about lasers. If I see this laser, I definitely will not be able to sit down and lie on this bed. So um, show me afterwards. But it works really well. Success rate is very high, and it's revolutionized vision. And I'm going to come back to vision a little bit later in my talk. But even that maybe is a little bit abstract, because very few people in the audience ever go to a car manufacturer, and very few people in the audience have had this laser surgery. So I want to give you an example that you all are familiar with. So how many of you have a smartphone? Okay, everybody. You know, when I, when I, give, I give a similar talk 
to school children, I change it a little bit, and I, I say to them, who's got a smartphone? And they, of course, they all have these days. And then I say, and how many of you bought it to make telephone calls? And they laugh, of course. None of them buy phones to make telephone calls. And in fact, I was in Europe not so long ago, and there were these big billboards advertising the iPhone 6. And do you know how they advertise the iPhone 6? It's not by spelling out the battery life or you know, how cheap the cores are or anything else. It's a big photograph of a beautiful natural scene, like a mountain or a lake. And underneath they say, this photo was taken with the iPhone 6. So phones are sold on the basis of their camera capabilities. I mean, that's a fact. And if you look at the back of this phone, I, by the way, my lab doesn't get any sponsorship from Apple, <clears throat> just in case you were wondering. But if you have a look at the back, which is something we don't often do, what you notice is that the three things you see here are all photonic based. You have a camera, which has got a sensor and a bunch of lenses. You have a flash, which is a bunch of white LED, light emitting diodes, and you have an optical sensor. The back end of the phone is all photonics. And if you turn it around, so here's a Samsung phone, just to show you that I'm not sponsored by anyone. The front face is a liquid crystal display. Everything there is based on light. These are not electronic buttons. It's just a picture. The button is a picture. It's an image that you press which activates some function. Now, I've got a little sentence at the bottom here and on there, which says, why have we made so little progress? Let me explain what I mean by that. So how many of you would like to have a paper-thin phone, a phone that you could fold up and put in your pocket? That would be great, right? I would also like one. So the question is, and it's always nice to ask questions, probe things, so that you can understand why you don't have it. So why don't we have paper-thin phones? Like, what determines the thickness of this phone? Partly, yes. <clears throat> the other part is the optics. If you want to create a good image and you want to sell that as the main feature of this phone, then you need certain types of lenses. And lenses are made of glass. And that means a certain thickness in order to make the lens work. So the order of magnitude of this thickness, let's say it's about 10 millimeters. It's a little bit less, but order of magnitude, it's about 10 millimeters. And most of that comes from the lenses. The front face, the liquid crystal display, that is about 10 micrometers in thickness. That's about one-tenth of a human hair. So the front face is a thousand times thinner than the back part. Even though lenses have been around for hundreds of years, but liquid crystals haven't. Liquid crystals have only been around for decades. And this is such a big market. This market, just the lens design on cell phones, smartphones, is worth $15 billion a year. And it's growing faster than the cell phone market itself. So you might say, but how can the lens market be growing faster than the smartphone market if it's in a smartphone? Well, the reason is because everybody wants a good camera and because optical engineers couldn't imagine a scenario where people would face the camera towards them. And so now we're putting two cameras into phones for the selfies, right? So the, the market for the optics is huge. In fact, it's 50% bigger than the entire laser market around the world, just the market for the optics on cell phones. And um, so that's incredible. And if you, if you don't know how big $15 billion is, there's only two provinces in South Africa that make more per annum in GDP than, than that amount. That's Gauteng and the Western Cape. All the rest make less. So if we could just get into this market, we'd be on to a winner. So the question is then, and I want to give you a little physics lesson because I know that you've all been drinking and so you're in a good mood and so this is a chance to push some physics to you, okay? So how could we make a paper-thin fern? Well, to make a paper-thin fern, we need to make a paper-thin lens. We need to make the lens as thin as the front display and then we can compress the fern. 
And yes, it's true we have to worry about the batteries, but it seems that people don't worry about that anymore. When I go to buy a phone, I always tell them I want a long battery life, and they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm the only person who worries about how long the battery lasts for. But how do you make a paper-thin lens? Well, if you want to make a paper-thin lens, you need to know how lenses work. And lenses are very simple, so that's why I work in optics, because everything's very simple. So all lenses do is they take light and they bend it to a point. That's all. And the way they do that is that um, the light in the middle passes through, and as you go further away from the axis, it bends the light at a steeper and steeper angle, making sure that the light always overlaps at a common point. But it does it in a very special way, and I want you to remember this. It doesn't only bring the light to the same point, but it makes sure that the light gets there at the same time. And that's important. And the way it does that is by adjusting the thickness of the lens. So it adjusts the amount of glass that you have so that this path, which is longer than this path, sees less glass than the middle bit to compensate for the timing. And by this compensation, all the light gets to this point at the same time. So now we have a focus. So what can we do to get rid of the glass? If we could get rid of this thickness, then we could make our paper-thin lens. Well, one way that you could get rid of the glass, and we've done this before in our lab, is to replace it with air. So here's something you can do at home. All you need is a piece of metal pipe from the scrap metal dealer, nothing fancy about it, and you need some way to heat it. And I put it to you that if you have those conditions, you can make a lens. And this is how it works. <clears throat> so who's familiar with the mirage effect? Everybody in the audience would have at least heard of it. Okay? So it's that shimmering that you see on a road on a hot summer's day. And why does the road shimmer? So it shimmers because if you're standing over here and you're looking down the road, well, the light from the sky comes down but the, the air just above the road is quite hot, whereas the air further from the road is not as hot. So let's call it um, cool, maybe not cold. And light does something very interesting. It bends towards the cool air, and it does it because the cool air is more dense than the hot air. So the light wants to bend towards the cold part, so it slowly it's trying to bend up, 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 and eventually it does get up. So when you're standing over here and you look down this green path, you see the light from the sky. But you think that it's coming from the road. And so that's why roads appear to shimmer. That's also why on the desert, the old story is that people think they see water in the distance. Okay, so how do you make a lens from that? Well, imagine I could take this road and curl it up. So here's my road, and I'm going to curl it up into the shape of my pipe. Well, now the hot, the hot air will be on the edge, and the cold air will be in the middle. And if I put light down this pipe, remember light wants to bend towards the cold bit, so all the light will bend towards the middle, and so it will focus, and so you have a lens. And uh, this is a concept of how you could do it. So you could take your metal pipe, you heat it up any way you want. Um, we were a little bit crazy and did it with an uh, oxyacetylene torch, but you can just do it over a little flame. And then you pulse some light afterwards. If you don't have a laser at home, that's fine. What you do is you heat up the pipe, and then you hold it up, and you look at something distant. And this is what you'll see. So here's a little, a little cutout of Africa with little colored lights. And you see they're very blurry. They're, they're not really in focus. And then you hold up the pipe, and you look again at exactly the same image, and you'll see that they come into focus. And so you have a lens. So now we've got rid of the glass, but um, we have to have a heated pipe around with us to use our cell phone, so that's probably not a good idea. And I think we're getting further away from the paper-thin lens, <clears throat> so that's not going to work. There's another brilliant idea on how to get rid of the glass. I wish it was my idea, but it's not. It actually is Joshua Silver's idea. And um, if this was a smaller audience, I actually have some of these glasses in my office that I could pass around. So what Joshua Silver's done is he's taken away the glass and replaced it with two very thin plastic membranes. So imagine like a little cuvette, and you fill it with water. 
and attached to these, this little cylinder of water, this cylinder here and there, and there's two syringes, is you have these two syringes, and then you adjust the pressure of the water with the syringes until those little membranes bulge by just the right amount that your eyes are back in focus. So you put them on, and you look at something distant, and you do the adjustments, and when you're happy, you disconnect the syringes, and there you go, you've got a set of glasses. And if they break, you just go find a tap and fill them up again, <laughs> and away you go. So Joshua's plan is 2020 vision by 2020. And his argument is that if you do the statistics, and he's done it very, very carefully, you can show that we don't produce enough optometrists just to cover the backlog of people who need glasses. Forget about the new people coming every year. We can't even cover the backlog. And he's done wonderful studies where he's sent people to optometrists to have their eyes checked and find out what correction is needed. And then he's given them a set of these, and he finds that their own adjustments correlates extremely well with what you would get from an optometrist. So this is do-it-yourself glasses. They cost about a dollar. All right, so very, very cheap and very, very practical to send out. Um, but I don't think Apple are ever going to put water into their smartphones. So we still don't have a paper-thin lens, but it is a pretty nifty idea. So, so how can you make a paper-thin lens? So you can, again, you can go home, and if you have children, you can do this with your, with your child at home. It's extremely simple. So if you want to make a paper-thin lens, a good thing to start with is paper. And we'll start with some transparency sheets, which you cannot see here. It's very, very clear. In fact, when I talk to some schools, um, the older, the, the children have never heard of transparency sheets. So, um, and then I try to describe the old projectors with the lamp, and they look at me like I'm totally crazy. But, but all you need is some transparency sheets, a ruler, and a black cokey and you can make yourself a lens. It would help if you knew something about Pythagoras, um, but that's not essential, okay? That's all you need. So how do you do it? So imagine that this little yellow thing here is our paper-thin lens, right? So there's no glass there whatsoever. It's just the transparency sheet. And I want to bring all the light to this common point at the same time. Now, light is a wave. Well, you can argue with me later over some cocktails if you want to say it's a particle, but, but let's for the moment say that it's a wave. And waves have a wavelength. That just means the distance between two common points, and this distance is always the same. So it's, it's kind of like, it's very nice because it's kind of like the Gal train. So if you're at this point on the wave, and you're on that point on the wave, then it's, it's the same. So if you've gone here and you've gone across one complete cycle and you're back there, it's like being back to the beginning again. So in the morning, I, I live in Irene and I take the Gal train here to Witz. And in the morning, the train leaves every 10 minutes. And this is a true story. So one morning, I was on in my car to the station and they made this announcement that the train is running 10 minutes late. But the train runs every 10 minutes. So I thought, well that's fine, the, the train's back on time then. <laughs> How would I know that the train is late? Actually, it was a complete disaster. The train was an hour and a half late and there was chaos. But, but in principle, light is like the Gal train. So every 10 minutes, you're back to the beginning again. It's as if you know nothing happened. So I want all the light to get to the same point at the same time. So if you know some Pythagoras, you will immediately see that this length is not going to be the same as that length. This one will be longer. And if you didn't know any Pythagoras, then that's why you have the ruler, okay? So you can see that this is longer than this. And since I've got no glass to do the compensation, how can I get it to arrive there at the same time? So because light is like the Gal train, it doesn't matter if it's out of time, as long as it's precisely out of time by one wavelength like being 10 minutes out of time on the Gal train. If you're one wavelength out of time, then it's like you're back on time again. So all I have to do is make sure that this distance is exactly out of time by one wavelength, and then it's fine. 
But there will be other distances where that's not the case. So not every distance will do that. So imagine that the red line is something where it's not exactly in time, but exactly out of time. So I'm at the bottom and this one's at the top. So what I do is I take my black cokey pen and I just color out all the parts that I don't like, the parts that are not going to get there at the right time. And if I do that everywhere on my little transparency sheet, I'll have a whole bunch of black marks. And everywhere where I don't have a black mark is where the light will come through back on time again. And so your transparency sheet will look something like this. It will just be a bunch of black circles. Now the bad thing is that you cut out half the light. But the good thing is you have a paper thin lens. There's no glass. It's as thin as you want it to be. And so you can make it again, in fact, the thickness of a human hair. And that's exactly what we do. But we do a little trick. So instead of blocking out half the light, we add a little bit of glass back to bring it back into time again. And this glass, the thickness of this glass, is typically about one micron. So that's one hundredth of a human hair. And that's how thick we can make a lens today now. We can make a lens that's one hundredth of, your, of a human hair in thickness. But then you might say, well, you know, that was a lens bringing light to a single spot of focus. It might be a bit lonely if you're a single spot. So why not make two spots or three spots? Or in fact, in general, why don't you make any structured pattern that you like? So instead of just coloring out the parts that I don't like for the timing for one spot, I can start to do very complicated patterns to make very complicated structures. And so this is what, a, what it would look like under a microscope, and the height here is about one micrometer in, in size, so it's very, very thin. And what can you do? You can make very complicated patterns. So look at the smiley face. You can see my students obviously have far too much time on their hands. But you can do complex light patterns, and we call this structured light. Now today in my lab, we don't do this with glass anymore. We don't etch out these little patterns because it's too expensive and takes too much time. We don't have facilities to do that. And so we do it holographically. So that is that we, we teach a device. In fact, what we teach is your television set at home. So you have a LCD television, most likely at home, or you, your, your laptop screen is an LCD screen. Um, we take those screens and we teach them how to change light in much the same way that we're trying to manipulate the thickness of the lens to change the light. And so instead of a thickness change, we have a picture that is a color change. The color is a grayscale image, so it varies from white to black in lots of different gray colors. And those gray colors would be the same as having that height variation in the lens. And with this type of picture, put onto our little television screen, we can generate very, very complicated patterns. And the interesting thing about this is that the way we calculate these patterns is exactly the way you would do it in the old days with holograms. So in the old days, if you wanted to make a hologram like you see in your credit card, you need to have an object and you need to have a laser beam and then you do some interference and you get a hologram. Well, we do the same thing except we don't have the laser beam and we don't have the object. And so we call this digital holography of virtual objects, things that don't exist. So the smiley face doesn't really exist, but we can create a hologram to produce it. And if you go to the lab, then this is what it would look like. So this is what our lab would look like if you came to visit us. A whole bunch of optics, some electronics, a little liquid crystal. And if you look carefully, if the room was a little bit darker, you'd see it better but you can see the laser beam going off with some structured pattern on it. In this case, it's a beam with a hole in the middle, and uh, it carries angular momentum, and we have lots of fun playing with these, these type of beams. So we can control lights digitally with precisely the technology that you have on your phone or on your laptop or on your television. And we can do all this inside lasers. So a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, it was around the news that there was this digital laser, and it works on the same idea, that we can manipulate light in a very fast and complicated way 
inside the laser to get arbitrary patterns. And here you see some examples of very exotic patterns that we can produce from a laser. It's not quite like this, but, but not too far from it. So <clears throat> we call this beams on demand. It's structured light that we can produce on demand with all the tools in our lab. So now you might say, well, you told us at the beginning that you like to have fun with the taxpayer's money, and you can see that we have lots of fun, but why would we want to generate all these patterns? Like, what's the point? What would we do with patterns of light? And here's a, a little technical graph. It's the only technical graph in the whole talk. And what it shows is the year and the capacity of usage of the internet. And you're not surprised, I'm sure, to find that it's steadily increasing. But what I want you to see is that there have been certain technologies along the way that have made this increase possible. So we're using more and more every single year because people want to download their YouTube videos really, really fast, and many of them. And so we need more and more capacity. But this dotted line at the top is a fundamental limit of optical fiber. It's not an engineering problem, it's a basic physics problem. We can't cross this line. And if we cross it, we can't cross it by pushing more power into the fibers. That means just put more light in. You need more bandwidth, put in more light. It doesn't work. So we need a different technology. We need to change something. And what we want to change is to use patterns of light to increase the bandwidth. <clears throat> and that's a particularly moot point in South Africa. So I, I like to ask people, do you, do you know who this is? It's, this pigeon has a name. It's Winston. Does anybody remember Winston? People from Natal probably, right? So I'll tell you the story if you've forgotten it. So basically, there were a bunch of guys in Hillcrest, and they were getting the Helen because their telecom line was very, very slow. So what did they do? They took a big data set, it was a few gigabytes on a memory stick, and they tied it to Winston's leg, and Winston is a homing pigeon. And they sent Winston from Hillcrest to Durban, and at the same time, they started the download on the telecom line. <clears throat> and Winston got there first. <laughs> so it was all over the news, you know, internet faster by pigeon in South Africa. Yeah? So the data crunch is very real. That was a bit of a local example, but it is an, it's an international thing. We are going for this crunch. And so we want to use patterns of light to increase the bandwidth. And the idea is that if you imagine these patterns as being very unique, so if I can create them and I can detect them, then I can use them as almost like channels to carry information. Now at the moment, we only use one pattern of lights in all of our fiber optic networks. That's because the detectors we have don't recognize patterns. And so they're just what I call bucket detectors. They say, is there some light or is there no light? But if we have detectors that can recognize the patterns, then every pattern can carry the same amount of information as what we carry at the moment. So in this example, if I'm using five patterns of light, I can increase the present bandwidth by a factor of five. So this is an amazing technology, and we're hoping that it's going to overcome the crunch. And interestingly, on Sunday, I was at a lunch with a bunch of artists, and artists always say quirky things just out of the blue. And this, this one lady, while I was pouring her a drink, said to me, I hope science saves us because people won't. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? And then she said, well, people won't change their behavior. She doesn't think, you know, it's, it's not, not in our nature. People won't change their behavior. So for all the problems we've got, we're going to have to have fine solutions from science. Now, I'm not sure if that's really true or not, but it's a nice thought. And this is maybe one of those examples. People are not going to download yes, less YouTubes and uh, watch less videos. It's not going to happen. And so we really do need a technological solution to get across this hurdle. Um, so I was going to show you some videos, but in the end we decided to skip it. But this very, very complicated picture here shows you a detector that's looking for 100 patterns of lights. And we can demonstrate this in our lab now, that we can generate and detect 100 patterns at once. And this means that potentially we could push up bandwidth by a factor of 100. 
Now, for the companies to use technology, they want it to go up by a factor of a thousand. Otherwise, it's not worth their while to do this change. And so there's a lot of research going on all over the world, and we're doing some of it here at WITS as well. So I want to come back to the land story now, because I moved us off at a bit of a tangent by talking about this ability to compress the lens and then generalize that to very structured patterns and what you can do with it. But if you look at the credits at the bottom, you can see where this is from, and I'm sure you all know these are the so-called Google Glasses. And they're very interesting because, at least to my mind, it's, it, re, it questions the whole idea of, of what a projection is and the relationship between an image and an object. So, for example, do you need an image? Um, if you want to create an image, do you need an object? Is it necessary? Standard textbook science would say, of course you need an object. You cannot have an image without an object. That's a stupid question. But I'll show you some examples of maybe where we start to question that a little bit. So this is amazing because if you zoom into it, and maybe I'll go back one, here you have conventional lenses and these lenses are bringing real objects that are out there to the back of your retina. But then the projection system at the front is projecting onto the lens, using it as a screen. So that's, that's a completely digitally created image. It's exactly the technology that I showed you that we're doing in our lab, except here they're doing it with a little miniature projector. And instead of patterns of light, these are patterns of, say, a clock, or, or the temperature outside, or something else. The, the image of the temperature is just a complex or structured light field. It's nothing different to what I already showed you. So here we have a reality out there with real objects, and we have a virtual reality with virtual optic, objects, and they're all being projected through the same piece of glass and mixing them together. So this really starts to skew the very concepts of what is an image and what is an object. And we do the same thing, but not with lots of light. And now I'm going to contradict what I said earlier, but with single photons of light, single particles of light. So here's an experiment that we've done before. And it's very nice because it starts to ask another question, which is how many particles of light do you need if you want to form an image? So if I want to create an image of something, how much light do I need to do that? That's one of the questions that we're asking in our lab. So imagine that I, I have some scheme to generate two particles of light. We call them photons. And the one particle I'm going to send to that end of the room, and the other particle I'm going to send to the opposite end of the room. And then I'm going to do something only to the particle at the opposite end. Now, these two particles are not in contact. Okay? They're far apart. So on this one, let's say the one at this end, I'm going to put a little mask. <clears throat> I'm going to take my black cokey again with my transparency sheet. I'm going to color in some, some black, and I'm going to let the light through there. And now what I do is I look at the photon on the other side, and I say, what do you see? And what that photon sees is an image of what the other photon observed. So even though these photons are not communicating, and only one of them went through this object, the other photon creates an image of it. And so we call this interaction-free images. And it could be a way to start to probe biological samples or light-sensitive samples. The question is, I've shown you a couple of things that have advanced over time. So what do you think would be the next great breakthrough? And here's your chance to dream. And um, I think over the questions, you can maybe point out some things and we can see if we think it's realistic or not. But here's something that's on the horizon. Now, the bottom image that your smartphone will take x-rays, that's just a cartoon. But the other two are not. And the idea is that if the smartphone is a photonic device, and it's creating high, high resolution images. And it's storing those images. And at the same time, it's connected to an infinite database of knowledge on all topics. 
Or what could you do? You could start to analyze the image that you're capturing. Instead of just sharing them on social media, you could start to use them. And so we call this cell gnostics. So it's going from social media to social health. So you can get apps, for example, that if you take an image of a rash on your hand, it will analyze that image against a database of rashes. It will tell you what the most likely rash you've got, suggest uh, an appropriate cream to put on, and send an SMS to your doctor just to confirm. And that you can download today. You can also get these apps where if you take an image of some food types, it will tell you based on what you're looking at, whether it's fresh or edible or past its dates and what you should do with it. And if you're gathering light through a detector, well, you don't only have to gather images, you can also analyze the content of the light, not the content of the image. And in this particular application, there's a little spectrometer sitting behind the smartphone. It's very, very small. It's about the size of my thumb. But by connecting a spectrometer to the back of the smartphone, you have a, a spectrometer that analyzes the chemical contents of the light that's coming through the atmosphere to you. So you can start to analyze things. And the concept behind all of these applications is that, particularly in Africa, we don't have many doctors and we don't have many clinics, but nearly everybody's got a cell phone. So if we could take the point of care from the clinic to the phone, then we could maybe reach many, many more people than we do at present. So these are some of the things that are right now on the horizon. And I said to you that we were in the century of the photon and that electronics has been left behind. Of course, that's not entirely true. In fact, the, the exciting fields are where the two blend together. And here's something taken from the MIT webpage. You can go and have a look at it. They advertise their latest research. And what they've done is they've taken a contact lens and they've put together some photonic devices with electronic devices so that everything you see on that Google Glasses can be done now in your contact lens. Now, I'm not sure if I like that idea, getting my emails while I'm driving across my screen, but, um, <clears throat> but you have to say it's, it's, a, it's a very nifty technology. Okay, so I want to end by saying that um, you should come visit us. We're just up the road. This is just to r show you that uh, the university hasn't burnt down. Okay? This is what it looks like on a quiet day when the students are rioting at the union buildings. And, um, and this is a joke, all right? <laughs> so please come visit us. We're not so far away, and uh, we have a new lab. So if you like photonics, then also chat to us over a cocktail afterwards. You can find lots of stuff on the web on the International Year of Light, lots of popular articles, lots of resources to download that are for free for educational purposes, so please go and do that. And otherwise, come see our webpage. There's lots of uh, information there. And um, thank you very much for listening.